February 14, 2000, Shelby, North Carolina. The parents of nine-year-old Aisha Degree wake up to discover that she is missing from her bedroom. They eventually learn that motorists saw Aisha walking down the highway in the middle of the night, which indicates she left her home voluntarily for unknown reasons. Eighteen months later, Aisha's book bag is discovered 26 miles away, but she is still nowhere to be found. After that, the trail went cold. Hello everyone and welcome to the latest mini-sode of The Trail Went Cold. I'm your host Robin Warder, and today I will be covering the unsolved disappearance of nine-year-old Aisha Degree, a case which has been requested by numerous people these past few months, including a commenter named Lauren A. and a listener all the way from Ireland named Diana. Stories about missing children who have likely been abducted and murdered are very disturbing to cover, and I've had fans of this podcast tell me they cannot stomach listening to the episodes about victimized children because they are parents themselves. And that's a perfectly understandable reaction. But the disappearance of Aisha Degree is very strange and unusual. She vanished from her home in the middle of the night, and in cases like this, you'd ordinarily point to an abduction by an intruder or someone from the family being responsible. But here, the evidence suggests that Aisha left her home voluntarily, and no one has any idea why. I have previously featured this case in an article I wrote for listverse.com titled 10 Mysterious Disappearances with Bizarre Clues, which was originally published in April of 2013. But before we get started, just a quick reminder that The Trail Went Cold is now a weekly podcast which alternates between our regular full-length episodes and 15-20 to 20 minute minisodes like this one. We deliver either a new full-length episode or a new minisode every Wednesday. We're currently available for download on several platforms including iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play Music, so if you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it. The Trail Went Cold also has its own PayPal account and a new donate button on the website. If there's anyone out there who's feeling generous and wants to make a donation, we would greatly appreciate it, and we will be sure to give you a shout-out on a future episode. While we're on the subject, I need to give a shout-out to our two newest donors, Bob and Genevieve, so thank you very much, guys. And since we've entered a new month, November, I have to offer my sincere thanks to our listeners who've signed up to make monthly donations. They are Alice, Amber, Don, and Casey. I am very grateful to have such devoted fans. So with that out of the way, let us now examine the mysterious disappearance of Aisha Degree. Our story begins on Monday, February 14, 2000. Our central figure is a nine-year-old African-American girl named Aisha Degree, who lives in a rural home outside Shelby, North Carolina, with her parents Harold and Aquila Degree, and her ten-year-old brother O'Brien, with whom she shares a bedroom. At around 6.30 a.m. that morning, Aquila goes into her children's room to wake them up for school, and is surprised to discover that Aisha is not there. Approximately four hours earlier, Harold had checked in on the children before going to bed and saw that Aisha was sleeping, but for reasons unknown, she has since vanished. After not finding Aisha anywhere, the Degrees contact the police and report her missing, but an extensive search of the area turns up no trace of her. A possible abduction by an intruder is suspected, but what's strange is that there is no sign of any forced entry, and all the doors were still locked when the Degrees woke up that morning. O'Brien remembered hearing his sister's bed squeak sometime in the middle of the night, which made him think Aisha was tossing in her sleep, but he does not recall anything else. Things take an unexpected turn when the case makes the news later that day, and three motorists come forward to report that they saw a black girl matching Aisha's description walking south along North Carolina Highway 18 between 3.30 and 4.15 a.m. that morning. She was spotted in an area just over a mile away from her home. After passing her, one of the motorists claimed that he turned his vehicle around to go see if she needed help and circled three times before he saw her run into the woods and disappear. It turns out that Aisha's book bag and her purse were missing from her bedroom, along with several pairs of clothing. Aisha ordinarily kept her house key in the book bag, and since it was also gone, it seemed apparent that she had packed the bag and left the house voluntarily, locking the front door on the way out. But this also happened to be a very rainy and windy night, so the obvious question is, what could have possibly compelled Aisha to do this? Well, three days after Aisha's disappearance, some of her personal items were discovered inside the doorway of a tool shed which was located next to an upholstery business. These items included her Mickey Mouse hair bow, a pencil and marker which belonged to her, and some candy wrappers. This shed was in close proximity to the stretch of highway where Aisha had been seen walking. The investigation stalled for over a year, but took a disturbing turn when Aisha's book bag was discovered buried at a construction site near Highway 18 in early August of 2001. It was located 26 miles north of Shelby, and in the opposite direction of where Aisha was seen walking on the night she disappeared. Since the bag had her name and phone number written on it, and contained all the missing items of clothing from Aisha's bedroom, along with her house key and three family photographs, there was no doubt this bag belonged to her. But what was particularly unsettling was that the book bag had also been double wrapped in plastic trash bags, so this strongly suggested that Aisha had crossed paths with someone else who buried the bag. 
Some animal bones and men's khaki pants were found near the site, and while all of these items, including the book bag, were sent to an FBI laboratory for testing, the results of these tests have never been publicly revealed. As for Aisha's parents, they were cleared of any involvement in their daughter's disappearance, but sadly, the day she disappeared just happened to be the degree's 12th wedding anniversary, which was also Valentine's Day. The Degrees have spent the last 16 years doing everything in their power to keep their daughter's case in the spotlight. They have erected a billboard at the location where Aisha was seen running into the woods, and every year, they organize an annual walk from their home to that billboard in order to raise awareness for the case. Unfortunately, the Degrees also believe that Aisha's disappearance has not gotten the amount of attention it deserves because she is black, and as you probably know, the media often likes to focus more attention on cases involving missing children who are white. The FBI eventually got involved in the investigation, and in May of 2016, they announced that a new witness had come forward who may have seen Asia climbing into a dark green 1970s model of either a Lincoln Continental Mark IV or a Ford Thunderbird. This apparently took place along Highway 18 shortly before she vanished. Thus far, however, the new lead has failed to uncover any new developments. So I guess you could say, the trail went cold. So Asia's story is quite unlike most other child disappearances. The key to solving this case is figuring out the answer to the question, what could possibly have compelled Asia to leave her home in the middle of the night? By all accounts, Asia was a quiet, shy kid who was afraid of the dark. It's strange enough for any child to run away like that at 3 a.m., but I can't imagine why she'd do so on such a dark, stormy night with heavy rain and wind. One detail that leaps out at me is that the motorists who saw Asia walking along the highway stated she was wearing a long-sleeved white t-shirt and white pants, but in spite of the miserable weather, no one saw her wearing a coat. And no coat was found in Asia's book bag, nor were any coats missing from her home. Even though eyewitness accounts can sometimes be mistaken, I see no reason to doubt that these motorists really did see Asia, because how many other children would be walking down a highway at 4 a.m.? In cases like this where a child vanishes from their home, the first thing you have to do is investigate the family, but there is no indication that Harold and Iquila Degree were anything but loving parents who provided Asia with a happy home life. Like I said earlier, they have never stopped trying to keep their daughter's case in the spotlight, and they appear to have no skeletons in their closet at all. It doesn't sound like Aisha had any noticeable problems, as she was an honor student who almost never missed school and just seemed to be an all-around good kid. The same weekend she disappeared, the basketball team Aisha played on lost their first game of the season, and Aisha got upset because she fouled out. But it sounds like she got over it pretty quickly, and that hardly seems like a strong enough reason for her to run away. Now, at the time, Aisha's class at school was studying a children's book called The Whipping Boy, a fantasy story about a pair of kids who decide to run away from their kingdom and experience some adventures. It's been theorized that perhaps this story inspired Aisha to run away and go on her own little adventure, but again, would a nine-year-old feel compelled to do that on such a dark, rainy night? Sadly, the fact that Aisha's book bag was buried 26 miles away does suggest that she crossed paths with someone who did her harm. If the eyewitness sighting of Aisha climbing into the dark green car is accurate, then the driver of that car was probably responsible. But did this happen by pure chance because a motorist saw Aisha and decided to offer her a ride? Or was Aisha leaving her house to meet someone? I'm sure your first thought was that Aisha might have met some predator on the internet who lured her somewhere. Well, you can discount that theory, because not only did Aisha not surf the internet back then, her family did not even own a computer. But that doesn't mean that Aisha couldn't have befriended a predator somewhere, who convinced her to run away from her home to meet them in the middle of the night. It's here that I should make mention of a prominent blog dedicated to Aisha's disappearance at findingasiadegree.wordpress.com. It was put together by a woman named Wendy Hughes, who has no official affiliation with the case and does not know the Degree family personally but she was strongly affected by this mystery and is dedicated to solving it. The blog provides a wealth of information and some pretty extensive analysis, but her central theory is that when Aisha left her house, she climbed into a vehicle driven by someone who proceeded to drive her to that particular stretch of Highway 18. This individual then had Aisha walk down the side of the highway where she could be seen by other motorists, giving off the impression that Aisha was a runaway. The perpetrator then drove Aisha away from this location, and she soon became a victim of foul play. Now, my personal opinion is that this theory sounds way too elaborate and complicated for a child abduction. It just seems very risky and unnecessary for a perpetrator to let Aisha walk down the road alone like that, just so she could be seen by witnesses. What would happen if one of those motorists actually pulled over to help Aisha? If someone wanted to kidnap Aisha, all they would have to do is lure her into their vehicle and drive away, because there's nothing else to link them to the crime. That said, even though I don't quite agree with this particular theory, it would help explain some of the more baffling elements of this case. If someone made arrangements to meet Aisha outside her house in their car, then that could be the reason she didn't decide to bring a coat along with her. And there's also the fact that Aisha was last seen in her bedroom at 2.30 a.m., and the motorist saw her walking down the highway between 3.30 and 4.15. It's questionable whether a child could have made that mile-long walk from her house to that particular location in that time frame, especially if the weather was rainy and miserable, and she wasn't wearing a coat. I would not write off the possibility that someone did pick up Aisha outside her home, but I'm still not sure a predator would concoct this elaborate ruse of having Aisha walk down the highway like that, just for the purpose of getting her seen. 
The blog also makes some pretty strong points about Aisha's book bag, which I do agree with. I'm pretty sure that someone wanted that bag to be found. If they wanted to get rid of incriminating evidence, there are much better ways to do so than double wrapping it in trash bags and burying it at a construction site. I think the trash bags were used to preserve the book bag so that it would be in good condition when it was found and easily be identified as Aisha's. Another point I agree with is that it was no accident that the bag was discovered in early August, as Aisha's birthday was August the 5th. I think it's likely the perpetrator held onto the bag for a while and picked that particular month to plan it to be found. I also wouldn't be surprised if the items found in the tool shed in the days following Aisha's disappearance were also deliberately planted there. And if this person happened to know when Aisha's birthday was, then it would lend credence to the possibility that she was abducted by someone she knew. If Aisha was lured out of her house in the middle of the night, it's more plausible that it would be done by a person she trusted. But as for how this person would convince Aisha to meet them at such an odd hour, one intriguing theory I've read is that it might be related to the fact that the degree's wedding anniversary was that very same day. What if the perpetrator told Aisha they were going to give her an anniversary present for her parents, which she would surprise them with when they woke up that morning? We may never know the full truth about why Aisha left her home like that, but whatever the reasons, I'm sad to say that she was probably murdered shortly thereafter. I am glad this case is still making the news with the announcement this past May about the sighting of Aisha climbing into the green car. However, I do find it curious that it took a witness 16 years to come forward with this info. It would have been a lot more useful to circulate a description about such a distinctive vehicle at the time of Aisha's disappearance. Given that the car was supposedly a 1970s model, I have my doubts that whoever drove it would still have it now, and the vehicle is probably in some junkyard somewhere. But this gives me hope that whoever came forward with this information might know something more substantial which hasn't been released to the public yet, and maybe someone out there will remember someone who drove a vehicle with that description back in 2000. So if you happen to know something about the unsolved disappearance of Aisha Degree, please contact the appropriate authorities. I will be posting a link to Aisha's profile at the Charlie Project, which contains all the important details about her, along with the relevant contact info should you happen to have some tips you want to share. The number for the tip line is 1704-484-4822. That's 1704-484-4822. So that brings an end to this minisode. And feel free to leave me a comment or send me an email at robin.warder at icloud.com if you have your own theory about what might have happened. Once again, that's robin.warder at icloud.com. Also, be sure to check out The Trail Went Cold on Facebook and Twitter. We're now available for download on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play Music. So leave us a rating or a review at any of those places because that will help garner us more exposure and bring in some potential new listeners. We also have a donate button on our website, so if you're feeling generous and want to express your appreciation for all the hard work we put into this podcast, we'd be extremely grateful. I want to thank all my loyal listeners and supporters out there, especially those from the Unsolved Mysteries message board at the Sitcoms Online Forum and the Unresolved Mysteries subreddit. A big thank you to Miguel Foote, who does a great job of editing and assembling this podcast together for me, and also happens to be the managing editor of The Back Row, the website which hosts this very podcast. And of course, a big shout out to Vince Nitro, who composes the eerie music you hear on every episode. You can also check out my true crime and mystery articles at crack.com and listverse.com. And there's plenty of other non-true crime content you can find right here at the back row. So thank you all for listening and join me next week as I provide a brand new full-length episode of The Trail Went Cold.